I'm going to move over here so I don't block the screen real quick. <laughs> so my name is Jacob, for those who haven't met me. And uh, I'm excited to uh, speak tonight. But I always like to pray before I speak because, you know, maybe I'm a little nervous. Maybe not. Who knows? <laughs> but I do like to ask God for help. So, <laughs> Father, as I speak tonight, I pray, God, that your word would do the talking and that our hearts would be uh, just richly ministered to as we talk about the story of uh, things that happened with Jesus and things that happened with Peter. And I pray, God, for us that we'd be able to see the beauty of your uh, plan for redemption. In your name, amen. Okay, so I'm going to, oh, this is beautiful. Look at, uh, 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 uh. I like it when the clicker is responsive. So, um, so today I wanted to talk about uh, something to me that is kind of a, a very specific issue that I see a lot, of, not just in people who might not know the Lord, but in Christians. And uh, I, I want to start out with the first question. Why is it so hard to experience the promises of God? Now, the first thing I want to qualify is maybe you think God has promised you something that he hasn't, um, like healing spiritually and physically. We see throughout scripture, we see throughout uh, the Bible, a lot of times where God heals people spiritually with different things and physically. But we also see people like Paul, who like if anybody is going to be able to ask God and get some healing, who's, <laughs> you know, uh, it would be someone like that. But, you know, he struggled with things like blindness, um, which is really relatable. I just changed my glasses out and I had to write letters for our students at SYME on Saturday. And they were like, pick a verse. And I was thinking, hmm, see with what large letters I'm writing. That's the verse I probably should use. Um, <laughs> but God promises a lot in scripture. And when we see different promises, sometimes those are really incredible, like uh, peace and joy in the midst of suffering. Like that's an incredible thought. Uh, in Luke, where he says, you know, there, there is a way to not worry about money, clothing, or shelter. Anybody here just never worry about those things? Well, you guys aren't jumping at the chance to tell me, so that's, <laughs> I assume you are worried. Um, victory over sin. It is so hard to have victory over sin. It really is. But then books like Romans say, you know, we're not even a slave to sin anymore. And if you're struggling with sin, it can sometimes feel like, I'm not a slave to it, but I keep you know, kind of going back, like, how do I get free of this? Um, zeal, like, how many of you struggle with the idea to wake up in the morning and you're just like, your eyes open, you're like, oh, mercies of Lord, the Lord, they're new today. I'm going to go read my Bible. That's a struggle for some of us. For some of us, it's, it's not. And I have to uh, grow in some areas when I'm around them because I'm like, oh man, I'm jealous. But uh, supernatural powers. Now I'm going to ask you about this. Now I'm not talking about shooting lightning bolts. Uh, this is, I think, the focus sometimes when we talk about the supernatural in the Bible can be so focused on miracles and visions and those things. But I want to challenge you guys about, there's this list in Galatians, and I'm going to share it in a second, the, the fruit of the Spirit. It's incredible, right? If you have the Holy Spirit in you, you can have joy, and you can have peace. You can have really hard circumstances ha happen to you, and you're okay. You can have a relationship with someone that's really broken and step into that relationship and see it renewed. You could have somebody who is on the way to divorce in his family, 10 years later, have the healthiest marriage that anybody has seen. And people look and they're like, I want a marriage like that. It's like, well, if you only knew where I was at. The word of God can change us in amazing ways. But sometimes it's hard to experience that. So we're going to talk about Peter today. When I think about Peter, I think about uh, these types of dogs, you know, the ones where like, if you put them on a leash, they run faster than you do and drag you along. You have to be a little bit careful. Um, and I think about walking with, with God. Anybody here taken a dog on a walk who has taken you on the walk? <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, I, uh, I used to work at a kennel because my family had one. And it was pretty regular that you'd see a dog and it's just, it's really calm. And then all of a sudden it sees something and it's like, well, I'm flying now. Um, Peter was like this in the Bible. He ran ahead. <laughs> he's like walking with God and he's trying to all, with all the force. But what I see in the church a lot of times and in Christians is actually the opposite is this right here. So <laughs> sometimes we, we think about, man, it's so hard to submit to God. But when we finally do submit to God, 
This is how we submit. We're like, I'm reading my Bible, God. I'm going to church, right? And that's not how God wants you to walk with him, right? He wants you to walk with him, not drag you with him. And so that's my question. In your life, are you walking with God? Or is he dragging you along? Like, are you going to church because you have to or because you get to? Are you reading your Bible because you're excited about the incredible things that are going to change your life? Or do you read it because you know you got a Bible study coming up, and if you don't, it's a little bit awkward to be the guy who didn't read the passage. <laughs> you know, how is that with you? So these are three ways that I think we can show somebody is walking with God. And if you do the opposite, they're probably being dragged or maybe not walking with God at all. But the first is the fruit of the Spirit is evident in your life. So Galatians says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I mean, I think some of those fruit are like really, you look at them and you're like, you know what, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty nice, I'm kind, right? But like self-control, sometimes I can like feel really like I have a lot of self-control, but then I find myself at like 11 p.m. downstairs ordering from Uber and I'm like, what happened? How did I fall so quickly? <laughs> no, um, the reality of those we have a, a spirit from God, if you have the Holy Spirit in you, and a relationship with Christ, where we have access to these things. And that's incredible. And that to me is so exciting, but I feel like sometimes we don't get excited about the fact that we could actually have just like peace at night. We could go to bed and not worry about tomorrow. Like that's an incredible thing, and it's offered to us. Second, habitual sin is something you have broken or are breaking free from. And I say especially the big three. So idolatry, worshiping other gods, bloodshed, uh, murdering, <laughs> and uh, sexual misbehavior. The reason I put these big three is in the, the Bible, during the time of Jesus, there were some rules that rabbis had. And they talked about there was three things that like you could, there's these situations in the Bible like the Sabbath, where maybe a friend falls into a pit and you're like, do I help him? And they believed the law was given to preserve life. So they actually had some rules where they said, you know, different rules in the Bible. There might be a situation where it's like an order of operations, but the idea is preserving life. But they also said, you could never do these three things in order to preserve life. You couldn't just murder someone, even if you thought it was a good thing. That wasn't one of their belief systems. Uh, there's a famous illustration they use of if someone is stuck in a bad location, like a, like a prison, right? Could they, and they know that they could preserve their life by doing things like sexual immorality, they would say that's wrong. They'd say that's not, you know, that's not allowed. And one of the things is as we grow and we walk with God, we start to break free from these things. And if you are really struggling, then maybe there's a chance that you need to align your relationship with that. And then three, an active life of spiritual disciplines. Internalizing the word of God, praying, community, serving. If that's missing in your life, that might be an area where you could grow in. So I ask you all to think about it. Are you doing some of these things? So today we're going to look at one of my favorite redemption stories. And that's, uh, this is Peter and Jesus, uh, possibly. We get like a new movie every week of what they look like. But, um, <laughs> but the thing about Peter is he is a very interesting character. He probably has some of the lowest lows, the highest highs, the lowest lows. And today we're going to talk about one of the times that he was incredibly low. And the redemption story God goes through scripture with that. Um, but again, it's life. It's messy. You know, a couple of years after the redemption story today, he was in Galatia and Paul came to him and he's hanging out with people who believed in the law. And Paul's kind of like, I can smell the ham on your breath, Peter. Like, what are you doing? And he had to be rebuked. But he still is this incredible person through scripture. And I say that because you can't just walk with God and get to a certain point and it's like, I'm good. Every day you have to keep coming back to the source. And that's one of the things that uh, Peter, we see incredible things he did throughout his whole life. And we see that when Paul talked to him about that, he's like, I got to change, you know. Um, so the context today is Luke 20. So there's a time where Jesus is being questioned by the Pharisees. And they're asking him, like, whose authority do you speak on? Like, who, who is allowing you to speak? Because the Pharisees are wondering, is this guy saying he comes from God? And they're trying to trap him. So Jesus tells a parable, and this parable actually causes the Pharisees to kind of get together and be like, we got to kill this guy. So it's a very interesting passage of scripture. 
And then at the end, he quotes Psalm 118, 2022, or 22, not 2022. I say that a lot these days uh, with our dates. So one day, as he was teaching the people in the temple and proclaiming the good news, the chief priests and the scribes with the elders came and said to him, tell us by what authority are you doing these things? Who is it who gave you this authority? And he answered them, I will also ask you a question. Tell me, was the baptism of John in from heaven or of human origin. And Jesus is a master in the scriptures of doing this. Um, he says some stuff that I, I always love it when he talks to the Pharisees. And these guys have like read and memorized the first five books of the Bible. They've memorized more than probably anybody I've met. They're genuinely good people. Like they did have huge issues, but like Pharisees, they get a bad rap, but they did a lot of good things, even though they had a wrong idea on what that would mean sometimes. And Jesus will be like, well, have you ever heard? And it's like, these guys have memorized this Bible verse. He's always like kind of dunking on them. So they discussed it among themselves. If we say from heaven, he will say, why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, all the people will stone us because they're convinced that John was a prophet. So they answered that they didn't know its origin, which is interesting. You can tell they kind of know, but they're just afraid to answer that way because that means Jesus is right. And so Jesus said to him, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. And then he goes on to say in a parable, a man planted a vineyard, leased it to tenant farmers, and went away for a long time. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the farmers so that they might give him some fruit from the vineyard. But the farmers beat him and sent him away empty-handed. He sent yet another servant, but they beat that one too, treated him shamefully, and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent out yet a third, but they wounded this one too and threw him out. So he tells this story about this person who, uh, he has a vineyard and he's going to collect stuff and send the, his servants to them so that they can get some of the fruit. And they, these people keep getting beat up and it's a horrible story. So then he says, then the owner of the vineyard said, what should I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenant farmers saw him, they discussed it among themselves and said, this is the heir, let's kill him so that the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and kill those farmers and give the vineyard to others. And there's a lot of deep theology in this parable and lots of ways we can look at it. But the, the basic story is he's telling this story about God sending people and rejection and... Um, Jesus being sent, the son of God, the heir. And he says, they, they killed him and he'll be rejected. What's the consequence for that? And so the Pharisees said, but when they heard this, that must never happen. They're like, what a terrible story. Like that's unjust, right? So then Jesus looks at them and said, then what is the meaning of this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls, it will shatter him. And so he kind of at the end reveals, he's like, the Pharisees get the feeling of like, oh, this is about us and we need to submit to the things that Jesus is saying. Uh, otherwise, we're going to be, you know, there's going to be punishment, there's going to be judgment. And the funny part is that uh, this is what causes them to want to murder Jesus right here. Then the scribes and the chief priests looked for a way to get their hands on him that very hour because they knew he had told this parable against them, but they feared the people. So they know in their hearts that must never happen, but they still can't recognize Jesus. So this is the context to what we're in. So at this time, you would have had the disciples there with Jesus and uh, they're hearing this story and they're part of this interaction and it's just real interesting they're taken before these religious leaders, they're answering it, and there's this intense confrontation that kicks off the really difficult things that are gonna happen in the next you know, couple days. And uh, so this brings us to Peter. So Peter served with Jesus and he walked for, with him for years. He's outspoken, he's the guy who like jumps off the boat and swims in the water and does all that. Like uh, he told Jesus that if people ever were going to come and kill Jesus, he would rather die than deny Jesus. And Jesus warns him that he's gonna fail. And Peter took the warning and still failed. And he had to live with that moment. 
that regretful, painful moment where he had served and walked alongside the Son of God and actually rejected him. And not just rejected him like, I don't know that guy, but done it during the most painful moments with Jesus going to the cross. So we have the, uh, the moment where Jesus it warns him. It says, Simon, Simon, look out. Satan has asked to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And you, when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. So we're going to get back to this in a bit, but he kind of tells Peter, you know what, you're going to fail. But don't let your faith fail. And when you turn back, you're going to have the opportunity to lift up your brothers and help them grow. So this is my question for you. If you were to look in your deep, deep soul, if you were to go in the middle of the night in your bed and think, am I walking with God or am I not even walking with God? Am I being dragged? Or am I thinking I'm submitting, but I'm kind of like one foot in, one foot out, like, okay, God, it's fine, I'll do this. W when did that happen for you? Has it always been that way? Has it been because of sin? Or was there a painful event or a memory did you get hurt or betrayed? Did you fail? What, what do you look at and think, that's when I started being dragged by God rather than <laughs> walking with him? What was that moment? So now we're going to go to Acts 4, and it's been a short while since Jesus died and was resurrected. Like, not a long time. And this is the beginning of the early church. And one of the things that you need to realize is when you read the book of Luke— and you read the book of Acts, you're actually reading the same story. So Luke wrote Luke and continues the story in Acts. And it's very easy to miss that. And if we don't think about that, sometimes we don't connect passages. And one thing that's so important with scripture is to realize that the Bible, it's living and active. It connects with itself. So in Acts, there's this incredible story. And when I read this uh, the first time, it changed my life a lot to see this moment. So... While they were speaking to the people, the priests, the captains of the temple police, and the Sadducees confronted them because they were annoyed that they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. So they seized them and took them into custody until the next day, since it was already evening. But many of those who heard the message believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. So in the beginning of the church, you have thousands of people becoming Christians. And it's this incredible moment. And Peter is brought with some of the other disciples in front of the religious rulers. The next day, their rulers, elders, and scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and all members of the high priestly family. After they had Peter and John stand before them, they began to question them, by what power or in what name have you done this? So think about this. Peter had been in this situation before with Jesus. Whose authority do you come on? And this is the same people. And now he's standing before these people and he's the one who has to answer. But Peter denied Christ. And Peter actually saw what happened when Jesus answered that was the Pharisees all got together and said, we're going to kill Jesus and put him through the most humiliating, painful thing that could ever happen. So in that situation, the natural response would probably be, I'm going to back away a little bit. But we see this. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we're being examined today about a good deed done to a disabled man, by what means he was healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified and whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing here before you healthy. This Jesus is the stone rejected by you builders, which has become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. You know, we can often leave the story of Peter at the denying Christ and, and you know, he goes on to do good things. But it wasn't just that. God actually brought him right into the moment of his pain where he could have let brokenness keep him being dragged by God the rest of his life, where he, he saw where he failed. He brings him into that situation and gives him a chance for redemption. I think that's really pretty cool. And that makes me think your greatest failures may be the thing God wants you to step into and redeem if you stop making him drag you or you want him to stop dragging you. Like, think about it, right? You don't have to answer publicly, 
but I'm, I feel this way, so I'm, a, I'm, I'm not like super spiritual guy, so I'm assuming I eat a lot of Cheetos, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I'm assuming some of us feel this way, right? Do any of you guys sometimes just feel like, I can't believe I did that, or there's this memory you go back to of like a relationship that was really good and the relationship's broken and you're like, I wish there was healing there or there was something fixed. Or there's someone I think needs to know Jesus and I just haven't told him about it. I'm afraid. Or I know I need to talk to someone about this, but I really feel like it's just going to open up the floodgates. It's going to be painful. Uh, it might not be fun and I just don't want to do it. I think those are some of those moments we feel in life where we, we kind of get hit with the reality of things. It's like, it, it, it's the classic saying, like if you pray for patience, you're not going to get God supernaturally being like, okay, zap, now you can sit at the MRT till it's late all the time, right? Instead, you're going to get God being like, how do we grow you in steadfastness? Trials, here you go. And then that's how you grow, right? Sometimes to experience the fruit of the, the Spirit, we need to walk with God instead of saying, I want these things because it's so hard to face these things. So give them to me now, right? Give me joy so that when I go to this bad event, I'll have the joy and the event will be easier. But God dragged Peter into the hardest moment of his life again. So I always think about this in Hebrews. I'm not going to read this whole thing because uh, it's a lot, but Hebrews talks about um, in, in 12, basically this idea of discipline of the Lord. My son, do not take the Lord's discipline lightly or lose heart when you're reproved by him for the Lord disciplines the one he loves and punishes every son he receives, right? One of the scariest things you could feel as a Christian is like sinning all the time, never doing things in the Bible and feeling like your life is great and just blessings coming on you. Like you walk, you just find hundred dollar bills on the floor. Like that's a scary place to be. Because if you actually know Jesus and God is your father, he's going to actually be trying to grow you. And sometimes it's discipline. And it's different from punishment, right? Punishment is we do something wrong and you know, you're paying the consequences for it. Like Jesus took our punishment. So how can we still be disciplined? I always think about like a coach, right? Like coaches are both the, your best friend and the person you hate. And like when you have a coach and they're like, hey, do some laps, do this. I've never had a coach, which is why I would pretend to be a coach like that. I, I didn't do sports. <laughs> but on TV, they're always like, get down on the ground, right? You hate those types of relationships. You hate strictness. You hate rules. It's really painful. But then like 10 years later, when you look at your life and you look at the life of someone who didn't have that, Sometimes you're a little bit like, wow, I'm thankful for what I went through. And God is a loving father. And as we seek these ideas, like these promises of God, right? Joy and peace and goodness and kindness and self-control, we kind of have to realize what we're signing up for. And the fact is, if you're a Christian, he's going to start making you go through this anyways. And it's a lot harder to be dragged to grow than it is to walk with God and grow. So walking with God, versus being dragged by God. God may start to fill you with the fruit of the Spirit. Sin may be easier and easier to resist. And I said, and yet temptation harder and harder because we start to become more sensitive to sin. We start to see what sin actually is. Temptation doesn't go away. You get stronger in the Lord and are able to face it. You know, spiritual disciplines are not something you do for a moment, a season, or a reaction, but it's the direction of your life. It's like what you do. It's not something like, oh man, I just got really bad news on the telephone, I'm going to pray. Or, I can't believe I messed that up, I'm going to read my Bible for two months, then stop that habit. But when you're actually walking with God, the whole direction of your life is involved with these spiritual disciplines. So, Acts 4, when we go back, when they observed the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated and untrained men, <laughs> They must have had a great relationship with Luke for him to say this. Uh, they were amazed and recognized that they had been with Jesus. And since they saw the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in opposition. After they ordered them to leave the Sanhedrin, they conferred among themselves saying, what should we do with these men? For an obvious sign has been done through them, clear to everyone living in Jerusalem, and we can't deny it. 
so that this does not spread any further among the people, let's threaten them against speaking to anyone in this name again. So they called for them and ordered them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. So this time they're like, let's not kill them because they see that backfired, right? We now have 5,000 people following Jesus. So we got to do something else. Let's threaten them. And Peter and John answered, whether it's right in the sight of God for us to listen to you rather than to God, you decide. For we are unable to stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. After threatening them further, they released them. They found no way to punish them because the people were all giving glory to God over what had been done. For this sign of healing had been performed on a man over 40 years old. <laughs> Interesting. I guess when you're young, you don't usually get healed. <laughs> uh, but the reality is that God brought them into a situation and Peter and John not only tackle it, but they say like, I can't do anything but talk about Jesus. I have to talk about it. And what's amazing is the end of that was not them being dragged to the cross and having that happen. Although we do know that the lives of the disciples did not end on this physical earth in a happy way. Like they went through really hard stuff. They were martyred. But we also see that sometimes God will bring you into that moment of failure again. And you're so afraid about the consequences. You say, if I do this, I know it's going to happen, right? But maybe we can believe that our God is actually big enough to do something wild, right? Like these religious rulers didn't lose any of their power, but then they just released them. It's incredible. The fact is when you step into that, God can actually do something that you haven't even thought of. But we so easily can try and put ourselves in the place of telling the future and be like, if I do this, this will happen. But we serve a God who does some pretty wild, crazy things that aren't really the logical next step because he's God, right? He can make a way where there's no way. So, I want to end with this scripture, which we see at the, the end of Peter's life. And it's such an interesting passage for me. His divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. For these he has given us very great and precious promises, so that through them you may share in the divine nature, escaping the corruption that is in the world because of evil desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with goodness, goodness with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with endurance, endurance with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. Peter's saying God actually gave us everything we need to grow and to get past those things and not feel dragged anymore. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being useless or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The person who lacks these things is blind and short-sighted and has forgot the cleansing from his past sins. And I can only imagine when Peter is writing that, the thought of he's been there. Therefore, brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election because if you do these things, you will never stumble. And I think about that, that verse, the righteous man falls seven times but gets up again, but the wicked stumble and, you know, they're just like, they stumble and it's done, right? And that's the reality, right? If you keep falling, sometimes you can just stop getting up again. And that's one of those moments where you start kind of being dragged by God if you're a child of his, because he's, God's not going to give up on you. But the righteous person gets back up, starts adding to their faith, they start praying, they start growing, and God will walk them through it. So that's reality. Life is hard, right? Uh, so, there's that thing that Jesus said, Simon, Simon, look out. Satan has asked to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And you, when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Jesus told him how it was going to end. He said, you know what? You're going to deny me, but you're going to turn back. And um, you're going to be the person who strengthens your brothers and helps them get through this. And 5,000 people are added to the church. And he walks into this moment of failure. And he sees this beautiful redemption. And so I just have two questions to leave you with, and then I'm going to close in prayer. Can you walk instead of being dragged? Are there areas in your life where you are just not on the same page as God wants you to be? Is that something you're struggling with? And 1 Peter 1, 3 through 10, that's such an incredible passage, and it gives things like goodness, Knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with endurance, endurance with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, brotherly affection with love. 
Supplement your faith with these, right? What part of those things do you see missing in your life? Because maybe if you're struggling, that's a really good place to kind of start. Um, and if it's, if it's patience, you probably should expect <laughs> some beautiful lessons. But <laughs> with that, I'm going to pray and uh, just uh, ask God to bless this moment and to uh, bless us as we move on to communion. So, Father, we are so blessed to have a God who loves us and who knows we're going to fail but still <laughs> forgives us, walks with us, even allows us to go into the most painful moments of our life and find some sense of redemption to where we can say, you know, I did fail, but you know what? God actually is so great. He used me in a way to where it, it, it overcame that moment of failure. Pray, God, for everyone here that we would joyously feel like we're walking with God and know we were walking with God, that we'd be growing in our spiritual uh, fruit through the Spirit, and that if we need something in our life that needs to change, that today would be the day that it changed. We love you, Lord, and we just thank you as we go into communion for your sacrifice on the cross and for the resurrection that has changed all of us. In your name, amen.